please still call it twitter.com slash Studios America. Make sure to join us there. If you're watching on YouTube, like this video right now and subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell for notifications. Do all the things. Josh Hammer will be here to break down the legal stuff behind all the big news of the day. New York City's migrant crisis has costed a couple of excellent restaurants. No surprise there. But we start by doing the Trump indictment part four. Yes, we are here. I, you know, let me start this whole thing by telling you that I'm an idiot. An absolute idiot. Here I am, wearing the same suit every single day on this show. Nobody would know if I just repeated this show four times. I could have had four days off. All I'd have to do is keep it a little vague. That first New York indictment comes down is be like, oh gosh, this indictment uh, is one of the most unbelievable things. I can keep it vague and just keep rerunning this thing to you over and over and over again. I'd be home throwing back a Moscow mule right now. But no, I'm here telling you about the fourth, the fourth freaking indictment of Donald Trump. Trump charged in the Georgia 2020 election probe, his fourth indictment. Now, of course, Trump has responded. He says he plans to hold a press conference responding to the Georgia indictment. And he made a big statement on Truth Social. He says a large, complex, detailed, but irrefutable report on the presidential election fraud, which took place in Georgia, is almost complete and will be presented by me at a major news conference at 11 a.m. on Monday of next week in Bedminster, New Jersey. They're going to finally release the Kraken. They're going to finally do it after all this time. Uh, based on the results of a conclusive report, all charges should be dropped against me and others. There will be a complete exoneration. They never went after those that rigged the election. They only went after those that fought to fight the riggers. Quite an adventure on that last sentence. Um, look, you expect Trump to say that. He is not backing off of the 2020 thing. I think a lot of people believe that the 2020 thing was screwed up and there was all sorts of fraudulent stuff going on. It's up to you whether you believe that or not. But I think a lot of people also say, hey, like, can we move on and do other things? Now, of course, the media and the legal department, uh, the DOJ, do not want him to move on. They want him to be talking about uh, this over and over again. And in some ways, he's doing what he wants to do, right? He's fighting back against what he believes are unfair charges against him. On the other hand, he's kind of giving them exactly what, what they want, right? They want him to be focused on this and not looking forward to the election. But honestly, in his defense, it's, it's a little hard to look forward to anything else when you've been kind of, you know, you've been indicted four times, right? Like, it's difficult to move on. This is all he's probably thinking about all the time. And that, of course, is what they're trying to do here. Um, to break down the charges and the, the, the indictment, we'll, we'll do this in more depth with Josh Hammer here in a few minutes, who actually understands this stuff. But there was a, the, the big one was the racketeering charge, uh, racketeering, uh, a RICO uh, violation, uh, a fake electors plot. The, of course, there was focus on the Trump Raffensperger call. There was talk about the soliciting the uh, Georgia House Speaker. Uh, Trump's New Year's Eve lawsuit was mentioned, and the 2021 letter uh, in September to Raffensperger, long before even the election happened. It's sort of like a kitchen sink approach here when it comes to this particular indictment. They're throwing everything against the wall. They charged 19 people, 19 people, including big names like Rudy Giuliani and uh, Sidney Powell and um, uh, Jenna Ellis and Mark Meadows. They went after pretty much everybody they could think of to tie themselves to this. And, uh, you know, it doesn't seem like a serious effort because so many of these have been so unserious. You know, I think we've had problems at some level with all of these indictments. Um, and we have an update now on the day to day uh, situation, which was fascinating. Last time we had an indictment, this always seems to happen. On March 17th, Hunter admits the laptop. On March 18th, Trump indictment news. On uh, June 8th, FBI alleges Biden bribe. Uh, the next day, indictment. Hunter plea deal collapses on 726, 727, indictment. 731, De Devin Archer uh, testifies, 81, indictment. More damning Biden bank records released on 89, 811, DOJ illegally designates special counsel. Um, 814, FBI whistleblower transcript released. 814, Trump indicted. This seems to happen every time there's some big breaking thing going on in the Biden administ administration. But to be fair about the situation, there's new stuff almost every day in the Biden investigation. No one wants to pay attention to it, but I think you could make this case on almost any day because there's always something new. And, you know, 
I hate to be MSNBC here, but it does feel like the walls are closing in a little bit on Joe Biden. We'll get into more of that here in a bit. Um, we all knew this was going to be a stretch. We all knew that all these indictments would have elements that were reaches, right? They really want to take Donald Trump out, right? They really do. So what do they do? Well, they reach for anything that can be plausible. I mean, the entire New York arrangement from beginning to end was an, an, a gigantic reach. And I think now we're getting to the point where Trump supporters, people who like Donald Trump, and obviously it's the majority of Republican primary voters right now, are at a, they're having tension with themselves. There's a tension of two different tracks, uh, thoughts here going on when it relates to Trump. And it's fascinating to watch it all sort of play out because you have this thought, if you're a big Trump supporter, likely one of the reasons you like him is he's a fighter and he's a survivor. He's the ultimate survivor. He always gets through these things. They're not going to be able to get him in jail. He's going to beat it. He's going to win against all odds. Everyone said he was going to lose to Hillary Clinton. And then he came through. Everyone said he was going to be uh, impeached because of uh, the Mueller investigation. And he came through that. He came through January 6th. He's here now. And he's going to get out of this again. And that is part of what you like about Trump. He seems almost invincible at times to a lot of people. Then on the other hand, there's an argument made by many of the same people who say uh, the deep state is evil. They're here. They're, they're, they're all powerful. They're always doing everything. They derailed his whole pre presidency. They're the reason why Fauci stayed in. And all these things, all these criticisms of Trump, it was all the deep state the whole time. They're so powerful. Like, look at what they've done to him. Well, if they're that powerful, of course they're going to get him thrown in prison, right? But if he's such a survivor, of course he's not going to go to prison, right? Well, there's tension between those two things, and one of these things is going to play out pretty spectacularly here in the next uh, six months to a year. So what happens to this race? What happens now? What happens if, imagine Donald Trump being convicted here? And I think it's something you really do need to imagine, because these are people who are, they might not be uh, the most brilliant people in our society that are charging Donald Trump with this stuff, but I will say this, they're serious about taking Donald Trump out. And if you believe the deep state is powerful, if you believe the government is powerful, if you believe the media really hates Trump, if you believe all these things that you've probably said a hundred times, you have to take seriously the idea that they'll actually be able to do this. Like, we might have a candidate for president who's leading the field, who is going to prison, or is going to have some other major conviction uh, with some other sort of penalty. Who knows what it could be? And the timeline pays, plays out in a very weird way as we go forward over the next year. Let me just give you a taste of that. This is from a National uh, Review. Trump will spend the months leading up to the 2024 general election in and out of courtrooms. He is due in court to argue against a civil fraud accusation and a defamation case on January 15th and January 29th, 2024. Um, on May 20th, 2024, he will be in Florida defending himself against the criminal allegation that he mishandled classified documents and misled investigators. Special, special counsel Jack Smith seeks a January 2nd, 2024 trial date for the case involving the former president's conduct leading up to and culminating in the events of January 6, 2021. Arguments against Trump in Manhattan for uh, Alvin Bragg's case are set to be, uh, begin on March 25th of next year. And Fulton County uh, DA wants her prosecution uh, of the former president to begin in the next six months. All this stuff's going to kind of pile on top of each other. Now, some of this stuff will be moved. Some of it will be delayed. There will be all sorts of delays. This case in Georgia is going to take a long time to even find a jury. Uh, it's going to take weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks of jury selection, most likely. Uh, here's a little graphic to, to show this out. You see um, the charges filed uh, January th or July 31st, August 13th, June 8th, March 29th for these indictments. And the trial date's already in, in February, April, another couple in January. There's all this stuff going on. And there's been so many charges against Donald Trump and so many accusations against him. It's kind of hard to keep them straight. So I thought maybe we'd look at uh, the, the top five, which would include uh, the civil uh, one of the civil allegations, uh, the top five most risky things for Donald Trump right now legally. And, and when, I, when I measured this, what I'm talking about here is, number one, what are the chances of him actually getting convicted? Number two, what are the penalties if he does get convicted or does lose the case? Number three, how harsh is this on him politically? Will it actually 
move the needle because, look, it's not going to move the needle among Republicans. Republicans know Donald Trump. They've got this built in. They believe largely that uh, he is uh, being, uh, you know, submarined by the D- D- Department of Justice and Joe Biden, who is a, his opponent. And so I don't think anything's going to happen as far as affecting the primary unless we saw some massive piece of evidence we have no reason to believe is there. Uh, all the stuff that's been out, I don't think it's going to move the needle much. But I'm talking about, like, how does it move the needle in the general election? What about that middle-of-the-road voter who would consider Trump in normal, normal circumstances but gets turned off by all the legal chaos? Do those people exist? Uh, a lot of that has to do with how far the Biden uh, situation goes, honestly. If the Biden situation gets really, really bad, there's a, an argument to say that, okay, well, this stuff's going to cancel each other out. And I think that's part of the reason why Republicans are so interested in it, though I think it's totally valid to be interested in it. And as I've made the argument a million times, I think this is serious and I think Joe Biden was involved in it. We don't have ultimate proof of that, but we went through the evidence yesterday and I still heard people in between my show yesterday and today say, there's just no evidence that ties this to Joe Biden. Yes, there is. Go back and watch the show yesterday. We only touch, you know, scratch the surface here, but there absolutely is evidence. Is there definitive proof is a separate question, Um, but that's what happens when you go through an investigation. You try to find definitive proof. Anyway, here are the top five. The top five countdown for Donald Trump's legal situations at number five. E. Jean Carroll. Yes, she said there was an assault inside a department store. I don't think a lot of people necessarily believe that, but she's suing him again, and that one's in January. Number four is New York. Uh, The New York uh, allegations, honestly, to me, never really seemed particularly strong, and I think he will probably uh, win that, although you are talking about a New York uh, situation, so that could go against him as well. Number three, the Florida documents case. Look, most people will, uh, most of these legal ex- experts will say this is the strongest case when it comes to uh, the uh, the chances that he was actually doing something wrong, actually breaking a law that they can nail him on. A lot of people will say, yeah, they can nail him on this. The problem with this one in particular, though, is, number one, what is the punishment? Yes, they can try to throw him in jail for documents being stored incorrectly. That doesn't seem realistic. Could happen. He's also got a pretty good judge in this case. And honestly, at the end of the day, do the American people really care? Does this grabbing the American people uh, and their attention? Is this pulling them away from whatever reality show they're streaming right now? I mean, all I mean, eight out of nine seasons of Suits are on Netflix right now. All nine are on Amazon Prime. People are streaming it like crazy. Are they going to pull themselves away uh, from uh, from the, from suits to watch this? I don't think so. Harvey is going to keep their attention much more than stupid documents. And by the way, in the entire nine seasons of Suits, I don't think there's one documents case. No one cares about documents. So I think that's why I put it number three. Number two, the federal January 6 uh, case. This is a serious charge, though it's a somewhat weak effort at it, and they don't seem to have all that much. Number one, I think, is the Georgia election case that came out today. And I've been saying this for a long time, since the beginning of all these indictments. This is the one, if you're the Trump uh, administration or slash campaign, if you're Donald Trump, if you're a family member of Donald Trump, this is the one that would worry me the most. One of the things they're doing here with the, with the uh, RICO uh, part of this is they're trying to get other people to flip. People like Rudy Giuliani. I don't know, will he? Maybe, probably not. You know, Jenna Ellis, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, Sidney Powell. Will these people flip to try to get themselves out of trouble? This is why you structure a RICO Act uh, violation this way. And we'll get into this with Josh Hammer here in a couple of minutes. But, like, the reason why these RICO laws exist is if you had a person who's a low-level criminal in, a, in, a, in the mob, and they're going out and they're robbing uh, convenience stores and banks and uh, killing people, doing hits— you can find that person. You can convict that person of murder. You can convict that person of, of, of robbery. But that's sort of built into their job. They knew they were doing something bad. They knew they would get caught. If they do get caught, they know they have to keep their mouth shut. And so therefore, they can never tie it to the people at the top of the organization. What RICO allowed them to do, and, and look, there's questions about this. Uh, the ethics of this is sometimes a little uh, loose. But kind of blame everybody for everything. Look like, make this giant picture, this giant color my numbers of all these different people and all these different crimes and tie them all together so you can go after all of them at once. That includes the people at the top of the organization who you might not have on video killing somebody. 
It, it's understandable why these things happened. Uh, Rudy Giuliani himself used these rules uh, to great effect in New York. It's a very, very famous case. Um, but now they're going to come after him. They're going to try to get these people who are under uh, Trump to try to uh, say that Trump did things that uh, they haven't told them yet. They're going to put lots of legal pressure there and try to suss it out that way. It's a tough thing to beat. These are difficult, convoluted cases. They can get overturned a decent amount, but they're tough to beat. Now, what's fascinating about this is you had uh, the reaction from the media and the left is just pure jubilation. It's really incredible. Uh, and in fact, it's particularly incredible from this horrible person. Madam Secretary, fancy meeting you. Oh, here. I so can't nice believe this. <laughs> yeah, this is not the circumstances in which I expected to be talking to you. Nor me, Rachel. It's always good to talk to you. But honestly, um, I didn't think that it would be under these circumstances. <laughs> Yet another set of indictments. Oh, look at the big smile on Hillary's face. She doesn't care. You know what? She at, right after this clip cut off, she just started chanting, lock him up. Lock him up, lock him up. What happened to the lock her up thing? It is now changed to the lock him up thing. And I guess the lock him up thing is totally okay. It wasn't okay. The lock her up thing was going to de destroy our, our country, if you remember that right. Um, in fact, we have Jennifer Rubin. Lock her up is a chant of a banana republic. That's back in 2016. She's changed her tune just a tad. A day of reckoning for Donald Trump and his U.S. voting and the U.S. voting public as legal history is made. A lot of people have changed their minds since back then. And it's just, I don't know, maybe a little questionable what their motivations are. Here's Steve Schmidt, a person who really doesn't like Trump, former Republican uh, operative. Uh, here's what he said about lock her up back in the day. I do think the lock her up chant as it's received at home to that 32 percent of the electorate who will decide the outcome. It, it seems a little banana Republican to me. It's something that you're not used to hearing in this country. We don't lock up our political opponents. Oh, no. The rule of law matters and it matters to Republicans and Republicans emphasize the importance of the rule of law. Hmm. We've just had an investigation of Hillary Clinton. The FBI director made his recommendations to the Department of Justice, said she has been dishonest. She's not been truthful to the American people, but there was no cause for prosecution on that. And so I think that the, the chance uh, lock her up does not translate particularly well. Yeah, banana Republican, guys, that's what it was. Uh, Maxine Waters also had an interesting rant about this particular topic back in the 2016 era. I really do believe that much of what you saw coming out of Trump's mouth was a play from Putin's playbook. Oh, of course I think that when you saw him absolutely uh, calling Hillary crooked, uh, the uh, locker up, locker up, all of that was developed. I think that was developed strategically uh, with people from the Kremlin, uh, with Putin. <laughs> he, <laughs> he developed it with people in the Kremlin and with Putin. I, I mean, I. The, the, the stuff these people said in this era is just mesmerizing to look back on. Uh, I will also say, uh, if you don't want to send money to Ukraine for weapon systems, keep in mind that at any time, Vladimir Putin might call the people in Ukraine crooked. That's exactly what Vladimir Putin is known for. Uh, he may even say, lock them up at any time. So that's, uh, of course, what he's like. Here's the thing. And I, I hope people are going to have a realization here, if you haven't already. Uh, you know, there's a wide plethora of candidates to choose from. People will choose whoever they want. As I've said a million times, I'm not your dad. I don't care who you pick. Pick who you want to pick. Vote for who you want to vote for. You make your own decisions in your own life. But what I will say here is uh, we have to at least understand uh, what's going on. The people who want to put Donald Trump away are going to have four bites of this apple. Four bites of this apple. And they don't like Donald Trump. And they want him to go away forever. Isn't it going to be surprising if they fail on all four? Let me say it another way. In these four uh, investigations, there are 91 charges, 91 against Donald Trump right now. Do you think the government's going 0 for 91 here? Do you think they are? Now, look, that doesn't mean you don't vote for Donald Trump. Maybe it makes you even more. Uh, solidified in your uh, resolution to vote for him. He's being screwed and I'm going to vote for him no matter what they say. And that's fine. That's your decision to make. 
It may also make you nervous in a general election that, hey, if he gets the nomination, he might be beatable. Maybe a lot of people in the middle won't like the 91 convictions or 65 convictions or 42 convictions or whatever this number winds up being. I am going to be very surprised if they go 0 for 91, though. That's going to be very, very surprising. Now, as this goes on, you kind of wonder, you know, should Donald Trump just take a deal? I know he said he wouldn't. I know he doesn't want to take a deal. He doesn't want to admit anything. And of course, he wouldn't actually be admitting anything. But if he could get out of going to jail and push this stuff behind him and pay a fine or whatever, it might be the thing he could do and get this all out of the way before it even kicks off. I don't think he's going to be offered these deals. And I don't know. He doesn't seem to want to take them anyway. But this does make a situation a little bit complicated why would you run for office at this point? Because this is what your life is going to be like. You're going to be investigated. This is going to keep spreading. People, more and more people, local DAs and prosecutors are going to go after high-level political figures. People like Alvin Bragg are going to do this. Uh, the, the, the woman in Georgia, she's going to go do it as well. It's going to keep happening. And Republicans are going to do it after this too. So when this all happens, think of what it's an extra cost that goes into your decision of whether you're going to run for office or not. Why do it? Why bother? Why put yourself in that situation? This is going to happen, I would think, to Joe Biden if he is out of office. Someone is going to indict him, and he's going to be going through the same stuff. And honestly, I don't know where the end of the cycle, if it ever stops, everyone's going to find this tactic to be advantageous to them, desirable to them. And everyone who gets out of office is going to be chased down like this over and over and over again. I don't think it's a good precedent to set. I don't think this is the right way to handle it. Our founders had a way with impeachment and voting. That's the way that should go. The impeachment failed, though. They lost that and they couldn't take that. They couldn't take that they lost. So they're going this direction as well. We all know that the government has a lot of power. And the one thing they seem to be able to do is take out their enemies over and over and over again. That's the one time the government seems to gain confidence. We'll go through, if I'm right on this, and what these legal charges mean and how all this is going to look going forward. And maybe a little bit on Hunter Biden as well with Josh Hammer. He joins us here in just a second. The Durban Accords. Have you ever heard of this? Uh, this is August 22nd. Is that right? Oh, gosh, it's coming up close. Uh, BRICS nations like Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa are all going to announce potentially the launch of a new international super currency. It's been rumored for a long time. Some of them deny it. Some of them hint at it. But if this happens and it's backed by gold, it's going to be a stronger currency. And that's a real threat to U.S. supremacy when it comes to the dollar and all sorts of cornerstones of our financial system. How do you protect yourself from this? How do you protect your IRA? How do you protect your 401k? How do you protect yourself from the fallout of this announcement? Well, diversify with gold from Birch Gold Group. Uh, historically, gold has been a safe haven in times of high uncertainty, which I don't know if you noticed is right now. Get free info on gold, get gold IRAs, all the stuff. Decide if, for yourself if this is right for you. Do you want to do a tax-sheltered retirement account? Figure that out. Check out this information. Text the word STU to the number 989898. 989898 is the number. Uh, text the word STU there and uh, hook up with Birch Gold. Get this information. Make sure you understand how all this works and whether you can diversify into gold today. Text STU to the number 989898 and claim your free info kit from Birch Gold. I want to bring in Josh Hammer. He's a senior editor at large for Newsweek and host of The Josh Hammer Show. You should definitely check that out. Subscribe wherever you get your podcast. Do it right this moment. Josh, thanks for coming on the program, man. Anytime, Stu. Hope you're doing well. Yeah, doing well. Appreciate it. Uh, crazy day, as usual. I want to get into the details of indictment number 437 or whichever number we're at. Uh, but can you start by doing a ranking? There's four indictments. You got New York, you got Florida with the documents, you got the federal January 6th case, you got the Georgia case. Rank them here from weakest to the one that could give Donald, Trump's the most, the, Donald Trump the most trouble. Sure. So the Alvin Bragg indictment is definitely the weakest. I mean, that is the odd man out here. It is by far the weakest. 
as far as the theory of the prosecution, you had even fairly reasonable Democrats who were kind of up in arms over that one. That was a joke. I, I mean, that was the first out of the gate. It was frankly a total joke. It was kind of like the warm up act, you might say, <laughs> right, for, for what was to come. The second most dangerous, I would say, on the law, on the law at least, is Jack Smith's second indictment, which is the January 6th, uh, quote unquote, overturn the 2020 election, federal indictment, which places Donald Trump at the center of this sweeping national conspiracy and all of that. Now, uh, on the, I, 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 I caveat that by saying on the law, because this is in Washington, D.C., will be a Washington, D.C. based jury pool. The judge in that case, you know, is quite biased, I think, would be a polite way of saying that. But on the actual law, I have a ton of objections to that particular indictment. I, I think it is an extraordinarily weak theory of the case. It's kind of the quintessence of trying to politicize the law. I'm not a fan of that particular indictment. The other two comparatively are, in, in my opinion, are actually much more serious. So I, I think that as far as Donald Trump's likelihood of not going to jail, I, I think that the classified documents Mar-a-Lago case would be the third in that order because the Florida jury is probably going to be very mixed. It's kind of hard for me to see kind of a unanimous guilty. Obviously, we're totally guessing here. Who knows? The judge in that case, though, Judge Cannon, is certainly not nearly as biased as the case in D.C., Judge Chutkin. But the facts alleged in that particular indictment, I thought were quite damning in many respects, actually. And, and, and I thought that it was highly debatable whether or not Jack Smith should have used the Espionage Act, this, this World War One era statute, in order to prosecute a foreign president. That was a debatable prosecutorial decision. But the, the fact pattern they are the clear obstruction of justice in many ways. I mean, ignoring grand jury subpoenas doesn't look good. I mean, if it just does not look good. But I think this Georgia indictment is it is the most serious. Um, and I, I don't say that lightly because I'm not comfortable, to put it mildly, with the notion of using RICO at a federal or state level. Because, Stu, you have to remember, RICO came into existence as a way to crack down on organized crime. I mean, that was the entire purpose of RICO when it was first drafted. So what they're basically saying here in applying Georgia's RICO statute, they're saying that Donald Trump is is a mob boss. That's really what they're saying. Now, Georgia's specific RICO is, a, it is written much more broadly broadly than its federal kind of paternalistic equivalent. So it, it, it is possibly easier to, to prove that for the prosecutor. But there are numerous other aspects of this I think are very troubling for the former president. One is that there are so many other co-conspirators here, both named and unnamed. I think it's very likely the prosecution will be able to get some of them to flip, to get some sort of clemency or immunity in order to kind of turn against President Trump. Here in Georgia, you also have the governor, Brian Kemp, as well as the secretary of state and the lieutenant governor who are all against Donald Trump. So that is that is very, very difficult. That's kind of daunting, I think, to say the least there. And, you know, finally, perhaps most important is that Fulton County is a very, very liberal blue county. It's where Atlanta is. It's a heavily, heavily Hillary Clinton, Joe Biden voting county. And worst case scenario for Trump, and this is kind of the kicker here, is if they actually find a guilty verdict, not only would he, even if he somehow becomes president, not only would he not be able to pardon himself for it, because as president, you can only pardon yourself for federal crimes, not state crimes. But the Georgia governor, Brian Kemp, even if, if he were feeling generous, he wouldn't even actually be able to do it. Because because the Georgia state constitution has this very kind of Byzantine elaborate procedure for pardoning state crimes. So uh, that's the one, honestly, that I would be the most scared about. But that and the classified documents, to me, are definitely the two most serious of the four. Yeah, I mean, the documents case, it does, I think you're right. I mean, there's a lot of evidence that, you know, he the obstruction of justice thing seems pretty pretty clear. He, he was pissed off and just didn't want to play ball with them. And you, you can't do that in these cases. It's, he's going to have a tough time. But I don't think, like, the American people are all that passionate about where he stored his documents. Like, I don't know politically, at least, how much of an impact that one will have. The January 6th thing is still something that is on a lot of people's minds, particularly people that are not Republican primary voters. And this one, like, you look at this and it's it's a large sweeping investigation. They put up, what, 19 uh, people total. I mean, is the idea of taking it so broad here to try to get people like Rudy Giuliani, like Jenna Ellis, like whoever, to turn on Trump and give more information that they don't have already? What, what's the theory here? Yeah, I think that's definitely part of it. I mean, there are a lot of people whose names are invoked here. And, 
you know, part of this ultimately could depend on whether or not the Trump super PAC ends up subsidizing the legal the legal bills. I mean, you know, all of these other people, recall, are going to have to pay a ton of money in legal fees. So, you know, Jenna Ellis, who's a friend of mine, full disclosure, but she's actually a great example here. So I feel terrible for Jenna that she's had her name, you know, kind of dragged through the mud as part of this particular indictment. But Jenna's also on record now as, you know, clearly favoring Ron DeSantis, not, not Donald Trump. So does that mean that the Trump super PAC would actually not pay for her legal bills. And if so, does that make Jenna more likely to take an immunity deal? I have no, I haven't talked with Jenna about this. I have no inside information, but I'm kind of speculating here, putting on my lawyer prosecution hat. So th th there's a million variables here. And you also have to remember that let's not forget what this case is ultimately mostly about, which is, you know, that infamous phone call or phone calls that Donald Trump had with Brad Raffensperger, the Georgia Secretary of State. I mean, they have recordings of that call. Now, again, will they will they be able to prove that that recording, which they will presumably play in court, will they be able to sh demonstrate to a jury that that meets the definition of RICO or the various other felonies they're charging him with? Again, in Fulton County, Georgia, a very, very liberal blue county, it's not particularly difficult to imagine that. Mm, I, I mean, it, it's, it's hard, honestly hard to imagine them going 0 for 91 on all these charges and not getting anything out of all of this stuff. But like st stepping out of Fulton County, out of Washington, D.C., and, you know, what could be a very biased jury. I think there's a, a very easy claim to make that Donald Trump did not handle this well. A lot of people, I think, uh, don't like what he did around January 6th, what he did after Safe Harbor Day on December 14th. That whole period, I think you can have a lot of questions politically about it. They tried to impeach him over it, right? They tried this already. Yeah. That's seemingly what the founders sort of wanted to happen in this type of situation. That was the process designated for this. Correct me if I'm wrong, Josh. But, you know, like, at the end of the day, is this is the stuff that he did and outlined in this uh, indictment a, a crime? Do we know, do you think that crosses the criminal line or do we just still need more information from what they have as far as evidence goes? So I strongly agree, Stu, with the point that you're making here, which is when it comes to the Georgia indictment and also Jack Smith's second indictment. Well, I mean, they're getting here, obviously, at post 2020 election up and through January 6th conduct. And look, many of the things that that Trump did were were wrong. Some of them were were outright sordid. I mean, when it gets into kind of the fake slates of electors, I mean, you know, to be clear, you are allowed to challenge slates of electors at the Electoral College. The, the early history of the American Republic is replete with examples of exactly that happening. But you are not allowed to kind of have fraudulent electors submitted for possible consideration. So a lot of these details are, are just really kind of messy. And indeed, in some instances, I would say outright sordid stuff. But recall, we're talking here about fundamentally political speech, not just speech, but political speech. Donald Trump is allowed to have whatever opinion he wants to have about the 2020 election, whether or not it is backed up by the facts. You know, Jack Smith and the prosecutor in Georgia think that his subjective intent, what prosecutors call his scienter, his subjective mentality, they think that this matters a lot, whether he knew the election was stolen, whether it was not stolen, blah, blah, blah. And my point is that it really does not actually matter as much as they think it does, because you are allowed to say false things. And with some limited exceptions, such as the Stolen Valor Act and Obama era statute and some other examples like that, with limited exceptions, you are actually allowed to lie as well. It is not a crime to lie in America, at least the last time that I checked. And, you know, political speech really is the very core, to It is the bread and butter of the free speech clause of the First Amendment. It is really not necessarily there to protect anything as much as it is there to protect political speech, qua political speech. So I have a ton of theoretical objections in theory to these two indictments pertaining to post-2020 election conduct. The final thing that I'll say on this front is, you know, again, putting on my lawyer hat here, the Supreme Court has a constitutional law doctrine called the political question doctrine. And what this basically means is that when you have a, a litigation, a, a lawsuit that is so quintessentially inherently political. So I'm thinking here of like a member of Congress challenging the president. Article one sues Article two or vice versa, something like that. And the court sometimes will kind of throw up its hands and they'll say, this is not legal. There is no judicial legal remedy here. The proper resolution of this is via the political process. And it's kind of that mentality, the political question doctrine, so to speak, that really ought to have been 
adapted to Donald Trump's post-2020 election conduct. Part of that was the impeachment remedy, as you said, and that failed. Given that that failed, the proper remedy was not to bring these two charges, but to let it play out at the ballot box in the form of the Republican presidential primary and, if he's a nominee, ultimately the next general election. Mm. All right. Well, we've got about a minute left here, Josh. Let's go right there. Uh, What do you think this does to the 2024 race? Does this help him in the primary? Does it hurt him in the general? Does it help him in the general? What do you think happens? Well, I think it clearly helps him in the primary. I mean, we've seen enough data points of this. I, I mean, I'm starting to think, that, you know, whether there's anything short of him actually going to to jail that will kind of, you know, stop this momentum of, of all these rally around the flag kind of voters rallying to his side because he is besieged. And I'm not trying to kind of make a light of it. I, I, I do think that most of these indictments are are frivolous. Some of them are less frivolous than others, to be clear. But uh, I think it definitely helps him for now in the primary. It also, I think, deeply wounds him for the general election. There's no doubt about that in my mind. I mean, every with every new indictment, every kind of struggling middle working class family who consistently tells pollsters that their most important issues are inflation, the price of bread, the price, price of gasoline, the pump. You know, why should the median voter who is struggling paycheck to paycheck to get by give a hoot about the former president, some this rich guy's legal troubles when they're just trying to get by? So it definitely hurts him with independents and moderates, I think. But. I guess we'll cease to. That's why they play the game. (laughs) It's going to be a hell of a next 18 months, I'll tell you that much. Uh, Josh Hammer, senior editor at large for Newsweek and host of a Josh Hammer show. I mean, if that didn't convince you to listen to Josh uh, every time the podcast comes out, I don't know what will. It's a great breakdown. Josh, thanks so much for coming on the program, man. Thanks for having me. Uh, Picture for a moment the supply chain going down. We've seen this happen with so many different products, but we haven't seen it as directly with medication. Medication is something we don't always think about. A lot of us might store some food or some water for the worst case scenarios, but what about the medications you need every single day? What about antibiotics? What if something goes wrong and you have an infection and all of a sudden you're not able to get the drugs that you typically would get? An easy thing to do is prepare with the Jace case. You get the Jace case, they're going to have five uh, different courses of antibiotics that you can use to treat Stuff that used to kill people but is now really basic, you know, respiratory infections, sinusitis, skin infections, a whole lot more. Well, it's a great way uh, to be ready for shortages, and it's also perfect for traveling. Don't get caught unprepared. Go to jacemedical.com. Enter the code STU at checkout. The promo code is STU at J-A-S-M-E medical.com, jacemedical.com. Check it out now. It's the Jace case from Jace Medical. Danny Meyer is a big-time New York City restaurateur. Uh, He's the guy who founded Shake Shack, uh, which I freaking love their fries. They're so good. Their fries are probably my favorite fries. Well, they got the cheese sauce with them. Oh, incredible. Anyway, uh, he's he's got a bunch of restaurants. A couple of them were in this hotel called the Redbury Hotel. Two restaurants he had in there. They were kind of higher end restaurants. And Look, New York City, having a restaurant right now, a little difficult because, of course, you had the COVID thing. There's a long shutdown. Business didn't come back. People aren't coming back to the office, really. So it's been really difficult. And if you're in a hotel, you got to have the banquet business. you got to have the business uh, men and women coming in and doing their thing. There's a lot to do there. Well, they made it through a lot of those challenges, and we're getting ready to hopefully ramp up their business in this particular hotel. And something happened. You see a bunch of migrants started showing up and they decided to house them in this hotel. So now there are no real customers. No one comes into the restaurants because, hey, everybody in the hotel is an illegal immigrant. So they can't come to the hotel. Amazing, amazing. It says that tenants at the Redbury, our two restaurants which occupy the lobby floor, have been eagerly anticipating the hotel's full post-pandemic reopening. They're still awaiting the post-pandemic reopening. Um, Now, uh, now, as the Redbury partners with the city to house asylum seekers, it's become clear that the timeline for that reopening has been extended indefinitely. While we admire and respect the Redbury's decision, the viability of our business relies significantly on hotel-related F&B operations, including event venues and the lobby bar. Not a lot of illegal immigrants throwing, like, weddings. You know, that's a, I don't know why. Major company Christmas parties, not big part of the asylum seeker community. Over and over again, the statement, by the way, kisses the butt of the city. Like, they're doing a wonderful thing here by ruining my business, but we're going to have to close down. So if you wanted to go to either one of those two restaurants, sorry, you're crap out of luck.
Now, let's say you've spent the past 20, 30 years eating too many Shake Shack fries with cheese sauce, and maybe your liver's about to explode. You may want to try Liver Health Formula. Uh, <laughs> liver Health Formula has already sold over 2 million bottles. It's very popular. The American Liver Foundation says that over 100 million Americans have fatty liver. That's like a third of the country. So it's not surprising that a lot of people are trying to figure out how to help the situation. Well, with all the stuff that we throw at our livers, you got to do something about this. And if you have a sluggish, fatty liver, you probably don't even know it, honestly. But you might, under, you might see that you gain weight. You might see that you feel tired all the time. Well, for decades, your liver has helped you with over 500 key functions every day. It's time you helped your liver. Liver Health Formula is an all-natural supplement, which contains 12 clinically proven botanicals that help recharge and protect your liver. Listeners of this particular program can take advantage of the special offer they've got going on right now. Liver Health Formula. Get a, a free bottle of blood sugar formula to reduce sugar cravings. You can join the happy customer list by visiting getliverhelp.com slash stew. Getliverhelp.com slash stew. Get your free bonus gift today. It's getliverhelp.com slash stew. A Montana judge uh, on Monday found that the, uh, Mo the state of Montana is violating its residents' right to a clean environment. Delivering a major victory to 16 kids, teens, and young adults behind the first U.S. youth-led climate trial in what has to be the single dumbest ruling I've ever seen in my entire life. Uh, this is what they do. They're trying all these uh, novel legal strategies. And they're putting a bunch of kids up there and being like, ah, you're hurting my nose. I can't breathe or whatever they're trying to do. Um, Judge Kathy Seeley of the first district court in Montana ruled the state lawmakers flouted Montana's constitutional right to a clean and healthful environment when they passed a law barring agencies from considering the climate effects of fossil fuel projects. The case is being watched nationwide as a bellwether for litigants who want to hold governments and fossil fuel companies accountable for climate change. And this is, you know, this is the sort of court shopping the left does. They just keep people will keep looking around, tr trying to f file all these dumb lawsuits, and eventually they get a, a friendly judge. Now, the Supreme Court is not going to let this go on, I don't think, um, but we will, we will see uh, eventually if this uh, gets shot down later on in court. Also, political developments, uh, Chris Christie, it, it, and people are really shocked by this. I don't think it's a massive shock, though it's not exactly good news for Ron DeSantis. Uh, Chris Christie has surpassed Ron DeSantis in the latest poll of New Hampshire. Now, this is just one state. Of course, it's a northeastern state. This is the state that Chris Christie will probably do uh, the best. Um, the, of course, it's, you know, again, I mean, talking about these polls, honestly, is just, you're just kind of shifting around the bottom of the barrel here as Donald Trump's still up by quite a bit, though uh, DeSantis had been closer in New Hampshire and other early states. This is not good news, of course, for DeSantis, who comes in. Uh, it's Christie at 9 percent and DeSantis is at 8 percent. Um, he was at 17 percent in March, so a real significant drop. Now, it's just one poll. Uh, Tim Scott is at 6 percent. Of course, Trump leads with 49 percent. Tim Scott is at 6 percent, as I mentioned. Uh, Doug Burgum has bought his way up to 4 percent, tied with Nikki Haley. And Vivek Ramaswamy and Perry Johnson, who I don't know if we've ever mentioned Perry Johnson. The only time I've ever heard of this guy is he, he seems to be in my social media feed a lot. I don't know. I'm being targeted by his ads. Uh, but I guess he's a... Uh, I guess he's running for president. I don't know much about him. Will Hurd, 1% uh, as well. 13% uh, of voters uh, said they were undecided. Now, uh, look, the path for DeSantis or somebody else is pretty clear here. you got to win Iowa. You win Iowa. That gives you some momentum to hopefully uh, be very competitive in New Hampshire. Honestly, do you need to win New Hampshire in this environment? If the polls look like this in January, probably you need to win both of those states. South Carolina is going to be very difficult uh, because a lot of the voters that are below DeSantis and uh, Trump are going to be split up with Haley and Scott. So that makes that sort of a convoluted situation. And then you're over to Nevada. Look, you're going to need some early victories if you're going to try to take out Donald Trump. He still leads by so much. But who knows? As we know, maybe we'll have 14 more indictments by then and it'll change the state of the race. Who knows? We are eight days away from the first debate of the 2024 season. Is Donald Trump going to show up? We don't know. It's on Fox News. They apparently don't want us to, to run any clips. So I don't know. We're going to be reading a lot of transcripts. On radio, Glenn uh, wants puppets. 
He's going to try to reenact the debate with puppets. So that's where we're going there. We're going to have a great election coverage for you, of course, all throughout the election season. And also debate coverage, pre-game show, post-game show, and extended coverage on Twitter.com slash America. Get your Blaze subscription at blazetv.com slash The promo code is Stu. We'll see you tomorrow.